Hi friends, just before we dive into today's episode, I want to ask a huge favor from you. Would you please consider being a supporter of the Why Catholic Podcast? There's four ways you can do this. First, you can become a patron and financially support this podcast. The basic level is $5 a month. To become a patron, go to whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Secondly, you can support this podcast by purchasing something from the Why Catholic merch shop on Etsy. Just go to etsy.com slash shop slash whycatholic. Third, you can also support Why Catholic by sharing episodes with your community. And lastly, you can support Why Catholic by inviting me to come and speak at your next parish event. For more information about that, please send me an email at whycatholic at substack.com. Thank you, friends, for your help. I couldn't do this without you. In 1224, three friars ascended a remote mountain called La Verna, or Mount Alverna, in Italy, in order to meditate and pray. One of the friars was none other than St. Francis of Assisi. While Francis was deep in prayer, he had a vision of a seraph, a type of angel, seemingly being crucified. While Francis contemplated the vision, he began to experience a strange phenomena. Here's how Thomas of Solano described what happened to Francis, quote, The marks of nails began to appear in his hands and feet, just as he had seen them slightly earlier in the crucified man above him. His wrists and feet seemed to be pierced by nails, and the heads of the nails appearing on his wrist and on the upper sides of his feet, the points appearing on the other side. The marks were round on the palm of each hand, but elongated on the other side, and small pieces of flesh jutting out from the rest took on the appearance of the nail ends, bent and driven back. In the same way, the marks of nails were impressed on his feet and projected beyond the rest of the flesh. Moreover, his right side had a large wound, as if it had been pierced with a spear, and it often bled so that his tunic and trousers were soaked with his sacred blood. End quote. St. Francis' experience was the first known case of what is known as the stigmata, a phenomenon where an individual receives the wounds of Christ, Over the centuries, certain pious Catholics have experienced this miracle. However, stigmata isn't what we think of when we think of miracle. It's not like being healed of some disease. It's actually a form of suffering. St. Bonaventure, describing St. Francis of Assisi's stigmata experience, noted that, quote, the sight of it amazed Francis and his soul experienced joy mingled with pain, end quote. Why might someone consider this painful phenomena to be a gift from God? Hi, this is Justin Hibbert, and you're listening to Why Catholic, my podcast about the what and why of Catholicism. Since episode 73, we've been focusing on Catholic ethos, ethos meaning the characteristic spirit of a community as manifested in its beliefs. Each of these episodes focus on a particular idea that you often hear in Catholicism, but may not get explained as often as it should. And one of those Catholic ideas, which we'll look at today, is the notion of suffering. My first introduction to Catholic suffering occurred long before I was Catholic, when I watched the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You might remember this sequence of cartoonish monks marching one by one in a line and then hitting themselves with these stone tablets and then jumping off a cliff to their death. Or you might recall the albino character from the Da Vinci Code named Silas, who uses this garter made of spikes, tighten it around his leg to purposefully cause suffering. In other scenes, he whips himself as a form of self-mortification. While those Hollywood embellished examples are a caricature, there have been Catholics who have practiced self-flagellation. The practice stems back nearly a thousand years by various pious religious individuals who taught that a Christian needed to identify with the physical pain of Jesus. And in some cases, priests even prescribed self-flagellation as a form of penance. Imagine going to confession and your priest says, now for your penance, I want you to whip yourself with a belt 10 times. You might be like, what happened to praying the Our Father in the Hail Mary? When I put my Protestant hat back on, that type of suffering seems bizarre beating yourself up for Jesus, who would do such a thing? As a Baptist evangelical type, we weren't particularly big on suffering. My attitude was, Jesus suffered, so I didn't have to. This might be why we didn't observe Lenten disciplines. In becoming Catholic, I've encountered this underlying ethos of welcoming and embracing suffering and purposefully incorporating it into your life. Fortunately, mostly gone are the days of self-flagellation, at least as far as I'm aware. But there are other common forms of suffering that you'll encounter in Catholic life. 
Probably most common is the season of Lent, where one gives up certain pleasures, whether that's eating meat, at least on Fridays, or abstaining from dietary pleasures like alcohol, chocolate, or coffee, or even giving up social media or television. Of course, those that enter into religious life take certain vows, including poverty, chastity, and obedience. There's a Catholic fraternal program called Exodus 90, which trains men in spiritual disciplines, but it also includes things like taking a cold shower in the morning. Taking a cold shower is a strategy that many athletes incorporate into their daily routine. Physical discipline and spiritual discipline go hand in hand. Paul even talks about this in Romans 9, quote, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable well, I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I pummel my body and subdue it, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. End quote. This notion of suffering in the Christian life seems far different than what you hear from preachers who peddle a prosperity gospel. So what is the point of suffering? Believe it or not, I think Stephen Colbert, yes, that Stephen Colbert, the host of The Late Show, gives the best explanation on the purpose of suffering. One of my favorite articles, which I come back to from time to time, is GQ Magazine's interview of Stephen Colbert in 2015, just before he took over as host of The Late Show. Joel Lovell, the interviewer and author of the article, shares how Stephen Colbert, a comedian and devout Catholic, turned the discussion to the topic of suffering. I've included the link to the article in the show notes, but let me read this excerpt. Quote, he, Stephen Colbert, was tracing an arc on the table with his fingers and speaking with such deliberation and care. I was left alone a lot after dad and the boys died, and it was just me and mom for a long time, he said. And by her example, am I not bitter? By her example. She was not. Broken? Yes. Bitter? No. Maybe, he said, she had to be that for him. He has said this before, that even in those days of unremitting grief, she drew on her faith that the only way to not be swallowed by sorrow, to in fact recognize that our sorrow is inseparable from our joy, is to always understand our suffering, ourselves, in the light of eternity. What is this in the light of eternity? Imagine being a parent so filled with your own pain, and yet still being able to pass that on to your son. It was a very healthy reciprocal acceptance of suffering, he said, which does not mean being defeated by suffering. Acceptance is not defeat. Acceptance is just awareness. He smiled in anticipation of the callback. You got to learn to love the bomb, he said. Boy, did I have a bomb when I was 10. That was quite an explosion, and I learned to love it. So that's why, maybe I don't know, that might be why you don't see me as someone angry and working out my demons on stage. It's that I love the thing that I most wish had not happened. I love the thing that I most wish had not happened. I asked him if he could help me understand that better, and he described a letter from Tolkien in response to a priest who had questioned whether Tolkien's mythos was sufficient doctrinaire, since it treated death not as a punishment for the sin of the fall, but as a gift. Tolkien says in a letter back, What punishments of God are not gifts? Colbert knocked his knuckles on the table. What punishments of God are not gifts, he said again. His eyes were filled with tears, so it would be ungrateful not to take everything with gratitude. It doesn't mean you want it. I can hold both of those ideas in my head, end quote. In an interview with CNN, Anderson Cooper choked up as he asked Stephen Colbert to expound on what he said in GQ about suffering. Take a listen. You told an interviewer, uh, that you have learned to, in your words, love the thing that I most wish had not happened. Um, I remember you that. Went on to, you went on to say, uh, what, what punishments of God are not gifts? Do you really believe that? Yes. It's a gift to exist. It's a gift to exist. And with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. And I guess I'm either a Catholic or a Buddhist when I say those <laughs> things, because I've heard those from, from uh -huh. both traditions. But I didn't learn it that I was grateful for the thing I most wish hadn't happened, is that I realized it. Mm -hmm. Is that, and it's, a, it's an odd, odd, oddly guilty feeling. It, you don't, it doesn't mean you I don't are want, happy. I don't want it to have happened. I want it to not have happened. Right. But 
if you are grateful for your life, which I think is a positive thing to do, um, <laughs> yeah. not everybody is, right. and not, I'm not always, mm -hmm. um, but it's the most positive thing to do, then you have to be grateful for all of it. You, it's, you can't pick mm -hmm. and choose what you're grateful for. And then, so what do you get from loss? You get awareness of other people's loss. Well, that's true. Empathy. Which allows you to connect with that other person. Right. Which allows you to love more deeply and to understand what it's like to be a human being, if it's true that all humans suffer. Right. And so, at a young age, I suffered something so that by the time I was in serious relationships in my life with friends or with my wife or with my children, is that I have some understanding that everybody is suffering. And however imperfectly acknowledge their suffering and to connect with them and to love them in a deep way that not only accepts that all of us suffer but it also then makes you grateful for the fact that you have suffered so that you can know that about other people and that's that's what i mean it's it's about the fullness of your humanity mm -hmm. what's the point of being here and being human if you can't be the most human you can be i'm not saying best because you're going to be a bad person and a mm. most human. I want to be the most human I can be. Mm. And that involves acknowledging and ultimately being grateful for the things that I wish didn't happen because they gave me a gift. There are various types of suffering. There's punishment, there's those unexplainable life circumstances that happen to all of us, and there's the suffering that we purposefully endure for the sake of Christ. But what Stephen Colbert articulates so well is exactly what Scripture calls us to, to see suffering, any type of suffering, as a gift. With respect to God's punishing or disciplining us, Hebrews 12, 5 through 8 says, quote, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished by him, for the Lord disciplines him whom he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons, end quote. With respect to those tragic life circumstances like Stephen Colbert endured, Romans 5 reminds us to, quote, Rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, end quote. With respect to suffering for the cause of Christ, Jesus tells us, quote, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. End quote. The ultimate point of suffering is to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. And a mark of maturity in our sanctification process is when we are able to see that suffering not as a curse, but as a gift. After all, the whole incarnation, the humbling of God into human form, was a gift, the greatest gift the world would ever know. When I reflect on what Stephen Colbert said, I think about two particular seasons in my life, seasons I wished never would have happened, but seasons for which I am now grateful. The first was my early days of pastoring. I pastored the church I grew up in. I thought it would be easier because I knew the personalities and the culture of the church, but boy, was I in for a big surprise. Maybe it was because I was young and immature. Maybe it was because there were some really strong personalities, but I hated pastoring that church. It was a toxic church, and I didn't realize just how toxic it was until I started working for another church. When I resigned from my role as pastor at my second church, a church I loved and served at for 10 years, I reflected on my first pastoral experience. I said, you know, I'm thankful for the suffering I experienced in my early days as a pastor. I certainly wasn't thankful when I was in the middle of it, but what I endured helped prepare me for other challenges down the road. I would never go back to that church, but I never regret what I went through at that church. The second season occurred in 2011 when our family experienced the heartbreak of a miscarriage. My wife was about 14 weeks along. A routine sonogram failed to detect a heartbeat, and my wife was induced. Holding our lifeless child in the palm of our hands was the most heartbreaking moment we've ever experienced. I wish it never happened, but at the same time, I'm a different person because it happened. That tragedy has shaped my life in a way for which I am grateful. For one, I had a profound vision of Jesus with my daughter, something I talked about in episode 52 on the Communion of Saints. For another, it has helped me with ministering to those who have experienced the heartbreak of a miscarriage. A lot of people often misquote 1 Corinthians 10.13 and claim that God will never give us more than we can handle. I don't think that's true. I think we are often given more than we can handle, or at least that we think we can handle. 
I think even Jesus felt that his suffering and crucifixion was more than he could handle. This is why he asked the Father to take that cup from him. As I think about those who have received the stigmata over the years, I wonder if God specifically chooses those pious individuals because, like St. Francis of Assisi, they have reached a maturity to see those wounds of suffering as a gift. Unless we romanticize the stigmata, we need to be aware that they are indeed painful. In the show notes, I've included some videos about the stigmata, including a video of the last mass that St. Padre Pio officiated. And if you look closely, you can see wraps on his hands because he also received the stigmata. In his testimony to a bishop, Padre Pio detailed receiving the stigmata in 1918. He said, quote, Then his suffering was apparent, as was his desire to join souls to his passion. He invited me to let his pains enter into me and to meditate on them and at the same time concern myself with the salvation of others. Following this, I felt full of compassion for the Lord's pains and I asked him what I could do. I heard this voice, I will unite you with my passion. And after this, the vision disappeared. I came back to myself, my reason returned, and I saw these signs here from which blood flowed. Before this, I did not have these. End quote. The Christian ethos of suffering is further proof of how countercultural a faith is. Society tries to avoid suffering at all costs. The message of the world is one of immediate gratification, but Christianity and Catholicism in particular includes an ethos of embracing suffering. If you think about it, often the greatest bonds are formed through suffering. Think of the many support groups that exist for losing a child, or those fighting an addiction, or people that are battling cancer, or survivors of some sort of horrific event like the Holocaust. In the same way that suffering brings us closer to each other, suffering also draws us closer to Christ. He identified with us in his suffering, and so too do we identify with him through suffering. This is why suffering is a gift. Thank you for joining me for Why Catholic. Be sure to subscribe to Why Catholic wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also subscribe to my Substack site and get the next episode in your email inbox. As a subscriber, you get a special discount code to the Why Catholic Etsy store. If you've been blessed by this podcast and you're feeling generous, there's also a way to financially support it and patrons get some extra perks. To become a free subscriber or a patron, just go to whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Also join me on Instagram at whycatholicpodcast, all one word. Thanks again for listening. My name is Justin Hibbard, and this is Why Catholic. God bless you.